Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of John in chapter 19. Today we find ourselves at the end of this chapter. Seems like we tarry alone in this chapter trying to trying to steal as much as we can out of the text. And not to ignore the relevance of the text and trying to discern as much as possible of the treasure that it is in the text. We have seen how our Savior was arrested, betrayed, was brought before Pontius Pilate. Phase his trial, and in all these things, we've seen John labor to explain to the reader that what the reader is seeing in the text, what the reader is seeing and reading, is not the tragic uh, story of a man who was greatly misunderstood, but rather <clears throat> the life, the testimony of the Son of God, the eternal. Son of God, John uses these adjectives to, to, to define, to refer to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> His goal is that the reader will, li will read the account and will believe in Jesus. He makes this very clear. So it takes time to explain, to put... <clears throat> the context to put a context to his narrative to to let the reader know that uh, what they reading is the fulfillment of what is written in the prophets and the law he wants the reader to understand that <clears throat> this is not a new faith this is not a new fad that has come out but rather this is the continuation and fulfillment of that ancient faith of the Jewish people. <clears throat> it seems that many have said, in fact, yesterday I was watching a documentary where I was reminded of this, <clears throat> that the other three gospels <clears throat> were written prior to John and they were called synoptics because they always share their overlap they have a similar <clears throat> a similar time frame a similar uh, uh, line and in the light and in the eyes of the early church they always appear to be, appear to be together matthew mark luke they appear to be together so that's why <clears throat> Scholars, I call them the Synoptic Gospels, a Greek composition that means to come, to be seen together. <clears throat> it is believed that John writes his Gospel about 30 or 40 years apart from, from, from Luke. At least 30 years in, in the late uh, 80s or early 90s. Some puts it puts this gospel prior to seventy AD, prior to the destruction of the of the temple. Reason being because it, John doesn't mention this in his gospel. Nonetheless, many have called this gospel uh, a reflection because John is looking from the future; he's looking back. And he has a, a, a better field of view of, of the events. He has a better understanding of what he saw and witnessed of that which he touched with his own hands, of that which, is, uh, which he experienced. So he's reflecting and he's explaining to the reader <clears throat> the meaning, the meaning of, of many things. For example... In what we shall read right now in our text, he stops in anticipation to what is coming to explain that what he is saying is the truth. 
let us begin in verse 35, <clears throat> chapter 19, verse 35. And we're going to read to the end of the chapter. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things to, uh, took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. No, not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, They will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but in secret, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he may take the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body away. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh, aloes, about 70 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloth with spices, as it is the burial custom for the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was closed at hand, that laid Jesus there. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and pray that you will illumine our hearts. We profit by your word that it may accomplish its purpose in us. As we hear it, that we may be transformed, given faith, peace obedience and perseverance father let us rejoice in the fact that christ is risen let us rejoice in his triumph thank you father in the name of christ as we pray for the persecuted saints this morning and ask for your blessing for shelter and food and protection for medical care father in the name of jesus christ we pray amen so they're elate there lay the body of him who healed the sick. There, there lay lifeless the hands who touched, who healed many. There lay lifeless the body of him who mastered the winds and the storm, who rebuked the storm, then laid the hands to heal the sick. There lay the feet of him who walked in water, <clears throat> of him who fed many. There lay him who rose the dead, lifeless, in a tomb. He had reached the limit of human endurance. We are told in the text that he was pierced on his side, and that when he was pierced, water and blood came out of his side. I never understood why until I myself experienced a collapsed lung. And that is exactly what it came out of me, water and blood, which tells us that he, his lungs gave up, his lung, lungs filled with, with liquid, that he suffered a death by asphyxiation. The most common reason why a lung, a lung will collapse in such a way is due to severe trauma. Many doctors who have applied the trade to, to, to analyze the, the circumstances of Jesus' <clears throat> death have concluded that the excessive trauma of the, of the lashing that he received by the canonite tail, that six-string uh, 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 artifact of torture and punishment had bones and metal and lead. They hit him with that 
and obviously torn his flesh, but also damaged his lungs. So by the time that he's crucified, his lungs are already filling with, with liquid. So he's hanging, he's hanging from that cross with arms are stretched, his weight upon them, when they put that little piece on the bottom of his feet uh, to give him a little bit of foothold to, to help him to, to push himself up to gasp for air. And that was not done as an act of kindness. It, it was done to prolong the agony of the crucified people so that they will last longer on that cross waiting for that. So lay, there he lay. He had reached the limit of human endurance. And now he has gone the way of all flesh. He has crossed the line that every man crosses. A line between life and death. He has gone across the point of no return. He has crossed a line of <clears throat> that many, the many religious leaders have crossed and never come back. Name them: Muhammad Gandhi, Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad. All died. All those men who have influenced history. have crossed this line and so did Jesus of Nazareth. Just let us imagine for a minute, <clears throat> let us imagine for a minute, what if this would had been the end of the Gospel of John? Or if all the other Gospels would have finished with the lifeless body just think for a minute. Because obviously when John wrote this gospel, <clears throat> he, uh, he he didn't put chapters on the chapters came later. But imagine if he has, he has ended his narrative with these words. So there, there lay Jesus in the tomb, dead. Now we know that this is not the case. This is the very reason John anticipates the triumph of the resurrection. And he pauses. You know, he pauses because he anticipates. Ima imagine, okay, so we, in our Western culture, we are used to uh, this. We know of the resurrection even probably before we read a gospel in our lives. We are proclaimed the gospel. If we are, uh, the chances are, if you're in America, you have heard the gospel in one way or another. Everybody knows that Jesus rose from the dead. But imagine somebody, <clears throat> for example, uh, who has never, who has never read the gospels, who had never heard the name of Jesus. Imagine the, 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 the uh, trauma, the 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 impact that, uh, and even the cynicism of skepticism <clears throat> of the reader who reads for the first time these words, because he's about to to hear, he's about to read that he was laid on that tomb on that Friday. He's about to hear that he was laid on that tomb. On that Friday, but he's about to see that he rose again on Sunday. So John anticipates perhaps a skepticism. Somebody reading this for the first time and not knowing anything about Christianity would say, No way, no way. But John anticipates this. Skepticism, if you will, and he stops and lifts a footnote for the reader. He lifts a footnote 
anticipating the, the, the reaction of the possible reaction of the reader of him who is reading this for the first time. So he stops in verse 35 and he says of himself, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. So John stops to assure the reader that what that what he's conveying in his narrative is not just the product of his imagination, that this is not another tale just like Homer's Iliad, but rather he is he's describing, he's narrating the truth. And this is imperative for John. That the reader understands that what he's reading, what he's reading in this text is something that happened in real time and space. This is not a fable, this is not a fairy tale, this is not a once and upon upon time somewhere in a faraway land, but rather that these things to, took place in the in the district of Judea, as it was known by the Romans in that day. That this is a real person and that he claimed to be the Son of God, and not only claimed to be the Son of God, but he demonstrated it. That he, that he showed with deeds, with signs that he performed, and with his words and his life, that he is the eternal Son of God. <clears throat> this is why John wants the reader to understand that this is the truth. He wants the reader to understand that he's not simply reading a fable, that he's reading about the living word, as he calls them in the beginning, in the introduction of his gospel. That's why he interrupts his narrative to, to drop that footnote, because he anticipates the skepticism of the reader. Somebody reading for the first time would say, no way, this, come on, no way, this is true. But it says, he who witnessed these things, his testimony is true and he knows that he's telling the truth. You see, <clears throat> this was the life of John, the apostle. This is what governed his life. This is, this is, this is what he lived for to testify about the truth. And he always wanted his audience, he always wanted those who heard, those who read his words, to understand that he has he had he had lived these things, that he saw them, that he touched Christ, that he experienced Christ, he lived with him, he saw these things, he lived through them. For example, in his first letter, this is how he begins his letter, by, by setting forth, but setting forth, but, but putting before the reader those things, the fact that he has seen, the fact that he has touched and experienced these this things. He says in 1 John in chapter 1, Verse 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, that which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Right, so John is saying to the reader that there's many things here to unpack, and I'm not going to do that, but I just for the sake of the, <clears throat> of the understanding of John and what he's saying, he's saying is that he has seen, touched, handled, witnessed, 
an eternal person. And he calls that the word of life. And he describes this word of life <clears throat> as him who was with the Father. Him who was with the Father and has been manifest. So what John is saying is that what he is conveying, what he is saying, what he's what he's telling about is divine revelation. It is it is the manifestation of the Son of God. And he view himself as one authorized, as one sent to proclaim it. As one sent to to proclaim this word of life. This is what what John is saying. He's saying that he has experienced, he has seen it with his eyes, touch, and now he wants the reader to share in that fellowship, in that faith that is been revealed to to them he says it several times in his gospel like his goal is that people will read and believe in jesus <clears throat> in verse 3 of his first letter it says that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that to you Excuse me, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. This fellowship is based upon the revelation of the Son of God. And it is the Son of God who makes for us to be able to have fellowship with the Father based on that faith based on that revelation so it is is all part of this faith that is delivered to us who believe to those who have believed in christ is delivered for us through the apostles to those who he authorized and chose and gave authority over the church and chose to be the ones who proclaim his gospel So this is what John wants the reader to understand. When he takes a break, when he drops the footnote to say, he who saw it has borne witness, his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth. <clears throat> Verse 35 in chapter 19. This is what he wants the reader to understand, that he's telling the truth. <coughs> Excuse me. So it is by believing in this truth that John says that one can have eternal life. By believing in Christ, by believing in Jesus. It is by believing in Jesus, by believing that He is the Messiah, by believing that He is the eternal Son of God <coughs> who was crucified. In the Roman cross, was condemned by a Roman prefix, betrayed by his people, the Jews, and rose from the dead, according to Scripture. This is the message that John wants the reader to believe. Now, you, you must understand this was a difficult message to believe, and it still is. <clears throat> But when it appears in his original context, in the in, in the in the first century, it was something impossible, and it still is. Because the 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 cross, as we know, was viewed in contempt. Was viewed in contempt.
cross was viewed in contempt. People thought they were crazy for proclaiming a crucified Messiah. And yet, this is the message that God chose to be the means by which he will save the world. And this is the assertion of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthian church. As a way of a, of a rebuke, Paul told the, the Corinthian church that God had decided <clears throat> to confound the wise by the foolishness of the gospel, for indeed it was viewed as a foolishness to believe in a crucified Messiah. The cross was viewed as something of contempt. Only the lowest of the criminals were crucified. And yet you have the Son of God on that Roman gibbet on a cross. This is what Paul said to the Corinthians, that God has decided to save those who will believe by the preaching of the cross, by the preaching of Christ and Him crucified. This is what Paul said to the Corinthians. He said when he considered his strategy to come to the to the church, excuse me, to Corinth for the first time to 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 bla to to open the trail, to blaze the trail. <clears throat> Paul said, "When I consider my brothers, how I was going to come to you, I considered to know nothing. Meaning, I was, I I decided not to come with clever of a speech. I decided not to come with a philosophy, or with any other scheme." but to preach to you Christ and Him crucified. The bare bone gospel, Messiah hanging on that cross. That's, that's the same thing that John is doing in his gospel. He's telling to the reader, hey, this is the truth. He died on that cross. Of course, this begs the question, why? But John makes it clear throughout his gospel that he is the Lamb of God. That on that cross is carrying our sins. On that cross, God is, is imputing to him and is charging him with the sin of the world. Is, is, he's treating him as though he had committed every, every sin that humanity had committed against God. <clears throat> and on that cross, he took the blow. He took the wrath of God, not only the physical sufferings, but the literal wrath of God, the eternal wrath of God. He took it in three hours. How is that possible? We don't know. But he did. And, he's done, he, he, and he did that. <clears throat> so that in this way, the wrath of God is satisfied. In this way, God is satisfied because his wrath must be satisfied. In this way, anyone who enters in Christ, anyone who by faith embraces Jesus Christ, can be forgiven of those sins and those sins removed forever from his account and never be charged with those sins anymore because Christ paid for them. But yes, there is a requirement. It is free for us. <clears throat> But it requires that we believe. The offer, the commandment, is to believe. Is to believe repenting. <clears throat> True and genuine faith consists of repenting and believing and continues to do so 
to the end. <clears throat> so this is what John is setting before us this morning. When he pauses to let the reader know that what he's about to to read about, what he's about to see, although we're going to stop here in verse 42 with Jesus laying on the tomb. John is preparing the reader for the greatness of the resurrection. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord. May it profit us, Father, in spite of everything. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. <clears throat>